Thank you everyone for attending. Uh, we are coming towards the end of the year, so we don't have time to go into the entire book, right? So for today, I chose about eight or nine ahadiths randomly from another book, not randomly, but from different chapters. Uh, each of which I think summarize some of the core virtues and characteristics that the believer is supposed to have. So the idea of the session is, even if you don't get a chance to go through the entire book, the main points that Imam al-Bukhari is emphasizing throughout the book, they reach out to these selected ahadiths, right? And the first one is a hadith that summarizes the importance of akhlaq. So, this entire book, Imam al-Bukhari wrote it to teach us akhlaq wa adab, character and manners. And the, next, the first two hadiths we're going to look at summarize why this is important, why this is a topic that he felt was necessary to write an entire book of hadith about. Right? Because he already has the chapter of adab wa akhlaq in his sahih, in the sahih Bukhari. But he still writes a separate hadith compilation on this topic. Why? Because this is, in our day-to-day -day interactions, this is the most important aspect of Islam. Right? There are different aspects of Islam. When it comes to our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the in our aqidah and our ibadah is most important. But when it comes to our day-to-day -day interactions, how we interact with other human beings, that is where our other wa akhlaq is most important. And so, the first hadith, عن أم الدرداء رضي الله عنها عن أبي الدرداء رضي الله عنه عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال من أودي حذله من الرفق فقد أودي حذله من الخير ومن حرم حذله من الرفق فقد حرم حذله من الخير أصل شيء في الميزان يوم من يوم القيامة مشن الخلق وإن الله لا يبغض الباحث البدي أم الدرداء رأيت من حزب أبو الدرداء من الرفق صلى الله عليه وسلم that the Prophet وسلم, said, whoever is given a portion of compassion has been given a portion of witness. And whoever has been denied a portion of compassion has been denied a portion of witness. He then said that good character is the heaviest good deed on one scale on the day of judgment because Allah hates the foul mouthed cost individual. So there are many aspects of this hadith that we can discuss. Let's start off with the narrators. It's very interesting the relationship between the narrators. Umay Darda and Abu Darda. There's actually two Umay Dardas. Abu Darda, anhu, he was married to a female Sahabi called Umay Darda. And she passes away early in the seal. And he married another woman and she also becomes known as Umay Darda. And she's the one who outlives him and the rates had been from him. So some of these scholars refer to them as Umm Darda al Kubra and Umm Darda al Sukra, the older and the younger. And the relationship between Umm Darda, the younger one, and Abu Darda is very interesting. Because when Abu Darda first converts to Islam, he is a bit too zealous, right? We have the narration where Umm Darda, the other one, complains to someone al Farsi that her husband is neglecting her. And he has to teach Abu Darda that your wife has a right over you, your body has a right over you, everyone their rights. And Abu Darda internalizes this and he becomes so good at taking care of his wife and fulfilling her rights and making her feel loved that the interesting story takes place when he's passing away with this woman Darda that he narrates to her the hadith that a woman will be in Jannah with the last man that she marries. When he narrates this hadith to Umm Darda, she says, she takes a oath by Allah that she will never marry again after him. And notice he's a young, old man and she is a young woman. But she loves him so much that she takes a oath by Allah that she will not marry anyone after Abu Darda. Abu Darda passes away, her idda ends, and the Khalifa himself, Muawiyah, sends a proposal to Umm Darda. And she sent a reply back telling him about her oath, her informing him that 
he has, she has made this promise because she wants to be with Abu Darda in Jannah. And he simply sends the advice that if that is the case, you should pass. Right? If you're a young lady, then we'll get married again for the rest of her life. So he advises her to pass to control her desires. But the point I'm getting here is the love between Umar Darda and Abu Darda. And there's a huge age gap between them. And we live in one of the only times in history where people have a problem with huge age gaps. But Islamically, there's nothing wrong with it. But there's this huge age gap between Abu Darda and Umar Darda. But there is such a strong love between them that when he passes away, she promises never to marry anyone else because she wants to be with him in general. So even though she gets proposals from the Khalifa at the time, she still refuses. And she spends the rest of her life as in the range of Hadith. Narrating hadith from her husband. And that's why there are many hadiths that begin like this. From Umar Darna, from Abu Darna. She narrates the hadith from her husband. Right? So she was uh, a very important narrator of a hadith and a very beautiful love story there between these two narrators, Abu Darna and his wife Umar Darna, may Allah be pleased to hold it there. So this is one of the hadiths he taught her, which teaches us three important things about other Wakala. Number one, the hadith tells us firstly about the most important part of good character. Then it tells us about the virtue of good character. And then it tells us about the worst type of character. So the best type of character, the virtue of character, the worst type of character. What is the best part of good character? Rifq, compassion. And again, we live in a time when some Muslims are demonizing the concept of compassion. Right? They use it as a slur against other Muslims. When you study the ahadith, this is the most emphasized quality for the believer. That we are supposed to be compassionate. We're supposed to care. We're supposed to genuinely care for others. And that should override almost anything else in our interaction with others. And some people these days think that to be a good Muslim, you have to be rough, you have to be harsh, you have to be mean. There's a time and place for everything. The general manner and character of the believer should be one of compassion. But yes, there is time for harshness, there is time for, uh, for, for getting serious with people, but that shouldn't be the norm. The norm should be compassion. Right? Our interaction with everyone should begin from a place of compassion. Then it is stated that the heaviest of deeds on the day of judgment is good character. I want us to contrast this with another hadith, where the Prophet said, that he said, should I inform you of the bankrupt person? And the Sahaba said, is the bankrupt person not the one who lost all their money? He said, no, the bankrupt person is the one who did a lot of good deeds, but he had bad character. He swore people, he lied to people, he betrayed people, he stole from people. So all of his good deeds will be given to them on the day of judgment and he will be left bankrupt. He will be left with no good deeds. Right? So, you compare these two ahadiths on one hand, Bad character can leave you bankrupt on the day of judgment. And its opposite, good character, would be heaviest on the day of judgment. That makes this one of the most essential parts of being a Muslim. And in our time journey, we, we don't emphasize this enough in our school curriculums, in our madrasa curriculums. We don't put enough emphasis on good character. This should be a core, central part of everything we teach to the next generation. That our religion is the religion of good character. That we know that the character of the early Muslims was on such a level that they did not need to do that. Their character was that. People would just interact with them, their compassion, their, their manners, their truthfulness, their courage, all of it was that. All of it was enough to get people to want to follow what they are following. And then the hadith ends by telling us about its opposite. Right? Allah says, or rather, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says that the heaviest of good deeds is good character because Allah hates the one who is foul mountain. Allah hates the one who is fahish, badi. Both of these words have the same meaning, right? It's double emphasis here. Fahish and badi means they use vulgar language, right? That they use vulgar language. This is something that is hated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, just a quick side note of here. The concept of vulgar language, you know, sometimes people make this these loopholes, they jump to these loopholes and tell you, but you know, using English words, there's nothing in the Quran of Hadith that says using this word is haram or using this word is wrong. Well, the Quran and Hadith gave us general principles and 
the interpretation of what counts as good, as good language and what counts as bad language, that is left up to the culture. Right? You know the culture that you live in, the time that you live in, the place that you live in, what is appropriate speech and what is not. Right? And this will be both from time to time, place to place, language to language. The overriding principle that every Muslim must follow is that in whatever place I live, I should not be found out. Are there exceptions? Yes, there are exceptions, right? We know at the Treaty of Arabia, Abu Bakr used very strong powerful language against the disbelievers. Uh, the kind that I can't even translate here because it's, it's, it's that bad, right? But that was an exception. It's like the only time we don't like to use language like that. That shows us that that's the exception. The norm is to do what Abu Bakr does every other day, which is to be a person who speaks with the most cleanest of language. And so, it's important to know that for all of this, they are the exceptions. For compassion, they are the exceptions, right? Compassion shouldn't drive you to feel so sorry for someone that you make the, har the haram halal for them, right? That you feel so sorry for someone saying, oh, it's fine for you. You're not allowed to do that. Compassion should drive you to do dawah, it should drive you to care for people, it should drive you to give charity, it should drive you to serve the community, it shouldn't drive you to change the religion. That's what our history of compassion. Likewise, we are supposed to be people who are clean mountain, who don't use foul language. But there may be times when it's necessary. There may be times when it's the only time your enemy is going to listen, the only way your enemy is going to listen is to use that kind of language. So that would be an exception, not the norm. The norm is to be clean mountain and that is part of good character. The other hadith about the virtues of good character that goes upon this, hadith number 284, Rasulullah <laughs> Abu Huraira narrates that Rasulullah said, A man may reach through his good character the status of one who spends his night in the hajj. When we think about what are the greatest good deeds that you can do, most of us, our mind goes to the hajj. Right? The hajj, this is the ibadat of the awliya. This is something that anyone who is righteous does. They are people who spend their nights in prayer. Well, what if you are someone who can't do that? What if you are someone who, who you just can't wake up at the hajj? You just don't have the ability to do so. You try. Are there other good deeds you could do that would help you reach that level? This hadith answers that question. You can live a life of good character. A life of good character could help you reach the level of someone who prays all night. Another good deed that helps you to reach that level is seeking and teaching Islamic knowledge. Right? And the scholars explain why do things like good character and, and teaching Islam, why are they equal to praying the Hajj? One of the scholars said, because the Hajj is a private act of worship between you and Allah. But good character and seeking knowledge, these are acts of worship that benefit the Ummah, they benefit others beside you. So, what is the personal ibadah and what is the ibadah that affects the community? And so you can reach the same level by doing different ibadah. And also it's important to note here another lesson from this is that Allah created people differently. And different people excel at different good deeds. And this is why there are eight doors to Jannah. There are eight doors to Jannah because each type of person excels at a different good deed. And so like in the time of Imam Malik, one of the Mujahideen wrote to him and he's like, we are out here fighting in the front line, you're sitting in Medina teaching. Right? And he wrote back saying, Allah has chosen different people to do different acts of worship. Some are engaged in zikr, some are praying the hajjah, some are fighting jihad, some are teaching the deen. All of it is valid. As long as you're doing what is wajib, beyond that, each person has their own part to play in serving the deen and doing good deeds. So, you shouldn't think there's only one type of piety. Like, if someone pays the hajjah, or they're not pious. It's like, it doesn't work like that. There's many different types of piety. Right? Someone who dedicates their life to doing dawah, that is a type of piety. Someone who dedicates their life to charity, we will look at an example of that a bit later today, that's a type of piety. If you look at the example of Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, the great Khalifa, Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, the great grandson of Omar ibn Khattab, he was the eighth of the Umayyad Khali uh, 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 Khalifas, and he is known as the most pious of the Umayyads. But his wife says, look, listen to what his wife Fatima Bin Abdul Malik Radulawanha said about Fatima bin Abdul Aziz, she says that he never used to pray the Hajjah too much, he never used to fast extra, but I never met a man who more taqwa than him. 
Think about that. We think taqwa is just, you know, you pray tahajjud and you fast it. But he said he didn't really pray extra tahajjud, he didn't really fast extra. His taqwa was being a just ruler. His taqwa was living a simple life and not living of the money of the people. His taqwa manifested itself in a very different way. And so the point here is that there are different ways to reach Allah all within the Sharia. Some people it is to do the hajjud, others it is to fasting, others it is to charity, others it is to good character. Right? They are all different ways. All of them are equally valid. Just because someone finds it difficult to break the hajjud doesn't mean that they can't become pious. There are other parts to piety as well. But we should strive to do as many as we can. And of course, the highest level is what Abu Bakr reached. That when the Prophet narrated that they are all these different dogs of paradise, Abu Bakr and he told Abu Bakr that he was all the dogs of the Ummah for you. Because he excelled in all types of needs. So for someone who excelled in every type of ibadah, they, that, they, they would have all of the dogs of Ummah for The next hadith. Before we move on to the next hadith, just one point on the narrator of the previous hadith, Abu Hurairah, I think everyone should know his biography. Right? He is the most famous narrator of hadith, the person who narrated the most hadith. But I just want to make one point. Uh, in our times, that there are people out there who are attacking the character of Abu Hurairah, right? And from a variety of different perspectives. But the one that, that, that's most recent, most new, most strange to me, is that now we are learning this idea? Uh, I've heard people say things like, I don't even say what they said, but they, they use the word misogynist to describe it. Right? And they say any hadith that is demeaning to women is narrated by Abu Huraira and he made them up because he hated women. Abu Huraira was a righteous Sahabi who narrated from Rasulullah what he heard. If, if what he narrated doesn't match your nafs or what you want to hear, there's not a problem with him or the hadith, the problem with you. There's an internal problem. Right? If someone is finding the hadith uncomfortable, the problem is not with the hadith, the problem is with the nafs. Because Rasulullah's job was to teach us the truth. And sometimes the truth is going to be something you don't want to hear. Right? So there are hadiths from Abu Huraira that some of the liberal movements try to reject, and they do it by trying to demonize his character. And this is something that is completely unacceptable. No Muslim should ever entertain any negative thoughts about any of the Sahaba at all. Right? That is something that is a red line. Never entertain any negative thoughts about the Sahaba. The next hadith is narrated by Abdullah ibn Amr radiallahu anhu. Actually, it's not even a hadith. This is a statement of Abdullah ibn Amr, the author. Right? Abdullah ibn Amr radiallahu said, he said they are four qualities. If you have them, then you can't be harmed, even if you don't have anything of this dunya, even if you're not wealthy. People can't harm you if you have these four qualities. What are they? Husnu khalika, good character. Afaqu tu'ma, you don't need much food. Restrain into eating, and it's a hard one. Sidko hadith, you are truthful in your speech. And the upholding of one's trust. So, this narration, Abdullah ibn Amr, is saying that if someone has these four characteristics, then no one can really hurt them. No one can really do anything to them because they've attained a, a level of piety that the dunya doesn't matter to them anymore. Right? If you have good character, if you don't need much food, if you're always truthful, if you always fulfill your, your trust, then these are the qualities of a righteous person. And again, let's talk about the narrator. Very fascinating fact about Abdullah ibn Amr. He is the son of Amr ibn Al-As radiallahu His father is more famous, but he was more righteous. Right? His father, Amr, is more famous. Who was Amr? He's the one who was sent to speak to Najashi on behalf of the Quraysh. And then he goes to Khalid ibn Walid and they convert to Islam together. And he's the one who conquers Palestine, Jerusalem. And he's the one whose army conquers Jerusalem and then Egypt. So he's a great figure in our history. But he's no more for his politics and his jihad. His son Amr is no more for his zuhud, his piety, and his knowledge of hadith. Now here's an interesting fact. The age difference between Amr and Abdullah ibn Amr is 12 years. Amr ibn al became a father when he was 12 years old. 
I mention this because sometimes when we read biographies of the Sahaba, there is the shock that somebody got married when they were 9 years old or 10 years old. That was the norm of the time. Age gaps didn't matter. People got married as soon as they hit puberty. So when you read about this at that time, that was the complete norm of that time. It shouldn't be something that shakes your faith. Sadly, nowadays for many people, it is something that shakes their faith, right? But the reality is, this was the norm of the time. People would get married as soon as they hit puberty. They would have children at a very young age because very really people expected to die by their thirties, right? There was no school, there was no university. By your thirties, you're gonna die from a plague or a war or something like that. So people lived a very different life back then. So it shouldn't be shocking when you hear that a Sahabi were married when she was nine years old, right? Or that a man, a Sahabi came upon when he was twelve years old. It was a different time. It was a different norm. Okay. The next thing is this one you all should know, right? So I won't go into too much details. You all should know, but I mention it here by means of reminder. And Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu maqal. I mean, Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam maqal kullu ma'arufi sadaqa. Jabir ibn Abdullah narrates that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said every good deed is sadaqa. Let's talk about this word sadaqa. We tend to translate this word as what's the common translation for sadaqa? Charity. I don't think this is the right translation. It confuses people. When you tell people smiling is charity, being intimate with your wife is charity, spending on your family is charity. It doesn't have the right uh, meaning in English, right? A better translation for sadaqa, or better not translate it at all, just use the Arabic, but a better translation would be an act of kindness. Every good deed is an act of kindness. You see, Salaqa doesn't mean charity in how we understand it in the English sense. In the English sense, when we think about charity, we think about helping someone who is poor than you. We think about giving money. Salaqa is a much broader term. It's anything you do that benefits anyone else. Anything you do that benefits anyone else is Salaqa. Every righteous deed is Salaqa. Anything you do that brings about any khair, then it is a salaqa. This is why the hadith says smiling is salaqa. Because when you smile, when you smile, you brighten up somebody's day. Right? You're not giving that person charity. You are being kind. Right? The hadith says that the best salaqa is the money you spend on your wife and children. And some people, they get offended by that. You say it's charity that you're spending on me. No, it's not charity. It's act of kindness. It's being kind to your wife and children. Right? The hadith that says that even being intimate with your spouse is salaqa. Being intimate with your spouse is an act of kindness, an act of love, an act of mercy. That's what is meant by it being salaqa. Not that it's a charity that you're giving that person, right? You're not doing charity to your spouse by being intimate with them. You are being kind and loving towards them. So we need to, the reason I brought this hadith up is that we need to change how we look at this word salaqa. It doesn't mean charity. It means our entire lifestyle should be one of kindness. In every interaction with every person. From how you treat your spouse or how you treat your children. You know, Hadith said even removing an object from the ground is salaqa. Because if you can act of kindness that will benefit a random person. And the narrator of this hadith and his relationship with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is itself an example of salaqa, of, of, of an act of kindness. Jamir ibn Abdullah was only Ansar. And his father was martyred in the Battle of Uhud. And he, at a very young age, probably like 14 or 15, right? Probably 14, because he, didn't, he wasn't allowed to fight in Uhud until probably 14, because 15 is the age when they start fighting in those days. So, around the age of 13 or 14, he becomes the man of the house with about nine sisters to take care of, and a huge debt that his father was owing the Jews of Medina. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there are many ahadiths of him simply walking with Jabir and talking to him and encouraging him and helping him to pay off his debts and advising him on how to raise his sisters and advising him on, on, on marriage and advising him on how to be with his wife who doesn't have a father to teach him these things. And basically, even though Jabir ibn Abdullah is one of the Ansar, he's not even like one of the leaders of the Ansar, he's not even one of the famous Ansar, he's just a random orphan amongst the Ansar. Yet, there are many ahadiths where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam goes out of his way to be there for Jabir. One of the narrations, he says that when the army was coming back, 
the other one walking far behind by himself in a state of of the, of, of, of sadness about the, his father's death and all of his responsibilities. And Rasulullah comes to walk with him and ask him what's the problem and ask him what's going on. And then he organizes a way for him to start paying off the debt. Right? This is kindness. This is real sadaqa. Where you see an orphan and you immediately want to help them in any way possible. Right? Every aspect of this is sadaqa. From walking with them, to smiling with them, to talking to them, to helping them pay off the debt, to advising them on raising their sisters, to advising them on marriage. All of it is sadaqa. With all of this is helping someone who doesn't have a father and being a father figure to them. And this again shows us the akhlaq of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the way he treated his sahaba. The next hadith again by Abu Huraira anhu, is one of my favorite hadiths on Islamic brotherhood. This is the hadith of prohibitions when it comes to brotherhood. Lines not to cross when dealing with other Muslims. Right? Things you don't do to other Muslims. That's what this hadith is about. And there are like 10 versions of this hadith narrated under the Muslim. I just showed the one that has, you know, it's like some of them have two words there, some have five words, some have different versions, but I chose the one that seems to have everything in it. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrates all of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam iyaqu wa dhan wa inna dhan akdabu al-hadith The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said beware of suspicion because suspicion is the most lying form of speech wa la dana jasu do not treat each other in business wa la tahasadu do not be jealous of each other wa la tabaqadu do not hold hatred for each other wa la dana qasu do not compete with one another wala daba dana baru do not boycott one another wa kunu ibadullah ikhwana rather o slaves of allah be brothers right or the translation be slaves of allah and brothers it's two ways to translate this one so the first half of this hadith yaqul wa dhan beware of suspicion this matches up with surah al-jara chapter 29 verse number 12 where allah says ya ayyuha alladhina amanu ittaqullaha kathiran min al-dhan inna ba'da dhanqa ta Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, O you who believe, stay away from dawn, from suspicion, because suspicion is sometimes a sin. So this, this word dawn, it's an important word. Dawn means what you think about others. And there are two types of dawn. Husnul dawn and su'ul dawn. Husnul dawn means good thoughts. That's what we're supposed to have about others. Su'ul dawn is what this hadith and this verse are prohibiting, and that is assuming the worst of others. So this is a prohibition mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Ujara, and then mentioned again in this hadith. And it's one that we don't talk about enough. Su Uzan, assuming the words of others. This seems to be the default these days, right? That we always assume this one's a Libyan, this one's a Kafir, this one's a liberal, this one's a Australian, this person's left Islam, and that person's a major sinner, and that person must be committing zina. And we just assume the words of everybody. And it doesn't become the, the characteristic of many people. And both the verse of brotherhood in Surah Mujarat and the hadith of brotherhood both begin with warning against suspicion. Why? Because if you have good thoughts about others, you're not going to do all these other things. If you have personal thoughts of others, you're not going to treat them, you're not going to be jealous of them, you're not going to hate them, you're not going to try and put them out of business because you want good for them. So, the concept that we need to take from this hadith, the main concept of this hadith, is that we must become people of husnudan and avoid sukudan. Husnudan, thinking the best about others, assuming the best of others. There is, you know, there are many, many narrations about this, but just to give you an example of what we mean by this, let's say you're, you're watching a lecture, right? And the lecturer says something that you think isn't right. Or he says something that's like a really bad step of the tongue. Like he just, you know, people when, when they talk, you know, always word themselves the best way. Sometimes they go back and hear what is that better. Now, what you find people today will do, they'll take a clip of that and say, I knew this person was a deviant. It slipped down. See, he's a deviant. He said this. And then let's take that 10 second clip and ruin the man's entire career based on it. Who's comes on? If you look at that clip and you say, maybe he didn't mean it. Maybe it's a slip of the tongue. You know? Maybe you didn't realize how it came across to other people. This is Husna Dawn. That you assume the best of others. Likewise, you see someone coming out of a, a place where they shouldn't be. Right? You can assume that they were there to cover their sin. 
Or you could be assumed they will have for other reasons. You know, maybe they will be sour. Maybe a relative was there was there and they went to admonish him and pull them out from him. Right? You you assume the best. You make excuses for people when you see them slip out. That is Hushnamza. So this hadith said, beware of su uzzah. Because the Quran says that sometimes suspicion is a sin. Sometimes. Because sometimes it's not a sin. Right? If it is two people sitting in the room and something goes missing and you assume the other person stole it, that's not a sin to assume it because there is plausible reason to, to assume it. So sometimes it's not a sin, but sometimes it is. But it is Aqtabul Hadith. It is the most lying form of thought. Right? The most lying form of thought. It is your mind lying to you. That this person is a deviant, that person is an extremist, that person is a liberal, that person is out of the world of Islam, that person hates me, that person is out to get me. This is your mind lying to you. This is your mind playing tricks on you. What's the goal of these tricks? What's the goal of these lies? To break the bonds of brother. To make Muslims hate each other. So this is why this is mentioned first and then all these prohibitions are mentioned. Because if you have personal done of people, you are not going to fall into these prohibitions. What are these prohibitions? La tana the, the Najah Shun is to treat people in business. You know, like when you sell a fake and you lie to people that is the original. Right? So you sell it at a much higher price than what it's actually worth. Then it's treating people in business. Prohibited in Islam. The Hasanu has jealousy. Right? We know jealousy is prohibited. The uh, is hatred. Right? To genuinely resent someone. A Muslim should not resent another Muslim. This is a difficult one to follow because everyone has people in their lives who who's harm them, who who's, who's cause them some kind of pain. But piety and good character comes from forgiving them. Even if you don't have anything to do with them after that, but you forgive them. And in your heart you say, this is my Muslim brother and I forgive them. You know, the Quran is so, it emphasizes this so much that even in the verse of of uh, a cause of executing the murderer. Allah says that you have the right to execute the murderer, but if you forgive your brother, that is better. If you forgive your brother, in that verse, Allah is calling the murderer your brother. And He said, if you forgive your brother, that is better. So even the cause of brotherhood are still there if someone murders a family member. And you are in the choice. Because in the Islamic court, if someone murders a family member, the head of the family has a choice to whether that person will be executed or pay the blood money or whether he is forgiven. Right? That the court will give it that choice to the head of the family. And the Quran says to forgive your brother is better. So forgiveness even in times of that, you know, you're still supposed to have the bonds of brother even at that level. That now means that you try to put somebody out of business. I just see there as competing. Right? So you have a business, another person has a similar business, and you're trying to run them out of business. You don't want them to get that risk. You don't you see them as their competition. In Islam, you're not supposed to see each other as competition. You're supposed to have this idea that risk is from Allah. Right? Risk is from Allah. You know, in some of the Muslim countries, you still see this. That you go to the marketplace and you have to buy something, and someone will tell you, go to my friend's shop, you didn't have any customers today. I had enough customers. And right? they still have this brotherhood with other shopkeepers. But because we live in a capital society, sometimes we end up with a capital mindset and we think of everybody as our competition. We see this even in Dawa. People look at other Dawa organizations as their competition. No, they're not their competition. They are brothers in Islam working towards the same goal. Right? And every space for everyone to succeed together. And the final prohibition here, La Tada Baru. La Tada Baru, do not boycott one another. And this will link to what we cover in another hadith coming up. Do not boycott one another. Another hadith coming up mentions that to stay away from someone purposely for more than three days in a, in a, in a way that you are cutting tight in them is a sin. And the longest hadith we're going to do today is a story of between two Sahabas where this happened. The story may shock you, but it's an important story for us to look at because uh, there's a very important lesson there about the importance of maintaining ties and not resenting each other, not boycotting each other. So this hadith calls on us to be brothers. And this brotherhood is for all believers. Brothers also means brothers and sisters. It's not, you know, one way only. So continuing on that, the next two are hadiths. I could only put one up for the other is very long. Hadith number 397 and 399. So if you open to page 76, so the hadith that I really want to go through. It's just too long to put it on a PowerPoint. But let's read 399 first because it explains it. <coughs> 
Abu Ayyub al-Zari Rajahun narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said لا يهد لأحد أن يحجر أخاه أو صلاته صلاته لا يعلم It is not permissible for a Muslim to boycott his brother for more than three nights يَلْتَقِيَانِ وَيَتُتُّ هَذَا وَيَتُتُّ هَذَا To such an extent that if they bump into each other, they both turn and go in different directions, right? They avoid each other خَيْرُ مَا الَّذِي يَبْدَأُ بِالْسَلَامِ The better one is the one who is first So the hadith says, it's not permissible to cut someone off for more than three days and if two people are in a state where they are angry with each other, the one who reads first, the one who makes peace first, is the better person. And let's look at a story where this actually happened between two of the most righteous of the Sahaba. Uh, and one actually boycotted the other and the other sought to make peace with them. And again, remember when you do hadith like this, you read hadith like this, you should not have negative thoughts about the Sahaba. Right? These are amongst the most righteous of the Sahaba and the best of the Sahaba. But they also, at some point in their life, made mistakes, and this is one of them. So it is narrated from Oth ibn Haris, the son of Aisha's brother, who said Aisha radiallahu was informed that Abdullah ibn Zubair, her nephew, said something about something that she was giving as a gift, that if she does not stop, I will prevent her from disposing of her property. She became angry and she said, did you really say that? And she was told yes, she said, I swear by Allah, I will never speak to Ibn Zubair again. So let's stop here and go to this slide. So, Abdullah Ibn Zubair, who was his mother? Anyone know? Who is the mother of Abdullah Ibn Zubair? He was the first of the Sahaba to be born in Medina. Very famous for his father, Ibn Zubair Ibn Allah. Who was his mother? Asma bin the Abiba, the sister of Aisha. So he is Aisha's nephew. Right, so this isn't just two Muslims breaking ties, this is family ties. It's important to know that this is her nephew because towards the end when they hug, you may confuse why Aisha is hugging a non mahram No, he is a mahram, right? So Abdullah ibn Zubair is the nephew of Aisha radiallahu anha. And Aisha radiallahu anha, one of her most amazing character traits was her generosity. Her generosity was on this level that if anyone gave her money, she would buy what she needs for the day and give the rest away to charity. Now Abdullah ibn Zubair, as one of her closest male relatives, took it upon himself to take care of her financially. Because her husband has passed away, her father has passed away, she doesn't have children. Her sons, I mean her nephews are like her sons. In fact, what was Aisha's kunya? Ume Abdullah. Who is Abdullah in Ume Abdullah? Abdullah ibn Zubair. She's called Ummay Abdullah because Abdullah ibn Zubair was like a son to her. Her nephew was like a son to her. So Abdullah ibn Zubair starts providing for her. But every time he gives her money, she gives it in charity. So he gets everything and he says, you know, maybe I'll take care of her money. So she doesn't give it all away in charity. So she gets everything and who's going to tell me what to do with my money? I'm not going to speak to you anymore. So tensions are, are, are flying there between relatives. And we see the human side of the Sahaba. But then we also see the piety that makes him on another level and the story goes on. So even today he seeks intercession from the from the Muhammad uh, after she had stayed away from him for a long time. And but she said, By Allah, I will not let anyone intercede for him, and I'll never break my vow that I have made. After they had gone on for a long time, even today he spoke to Ibn uh, Al Miswar Ibn Akrama and Abdul Rahman Ibn Aswad, who were from the Banu Zokra. They were the, the uncles of Rasulullah. And he told them, I ask you by Allah to go to Aisha because what she is doing is not permissible it's not permissible for her to cut a pie with me so they make a plan so for a long time this goes on Allah knows best how long maybe weeks maybe months but for a long time Aisha does not speak to her nephew at all so finally he makes a plan he goes to two of the prophet's uncles in Medina and he tells them to assist him so they make a plan what's their plan? al Misyar and Abdul Rahman they hide Abdullah ibn Zubair in their cloak and they go to the house of Aisha and they greet her with assalamu alaikum and they say can we come inside so she says yes you can come inside so they ask again all of us can all of us come inside she says you all can come inside and as soon as they come inside Abdullah ibn Zubair he jumps out from under the cloak he goes beyond the barla the hijab and he hugs her and he starts crying he hugs her and he starts and then 
Um, Mr. Abdul Rahman, they begin to speak to Aisha and to Talha too. She said, they say, you know that the Prophet forbade the cutting off of people. And you know it is not permissible for a Muslim to boycott another Muslim for more than three nights. So the same hadith they're bringing it here, they remind her of it. And they continue to remind her until she said, but I took a vow. I took a promise. A promise is a big thing. And they continue to remind her until she decided to break her promise and speak to Ibn Zubair. And as an atonement for her promise, she gave 40 slaves, she said 40 slaves, slaves free. And from then on, whenever she remembered this incident, she would cry and she would set 40 slaves free. So very packed hadith, raw lessons, a lot of things to think about. Uh, there's a lot of points I want to mention, but let's just go through and see the time you're going to go through. Okay, so just a few short points of this hadith. Uh, so, Aisha Radha, we know her to be amongst the most righteous of the Sahaba, or Muhammad al Mumini. This is one of the few times in her life where she did something wrong, and one of the greatest qualities of Aisha Radha is that if she ever messed up, not only would she repent, but anytime she would think about her mistake in the future, she would cry. That was the level of her dogma. You know, she would cry in the future when she would think about it. She, she does that for this and also for the battle of the camel. You know, against Ali, she would cry when she would like it. So she was someone who really took the concept of repentance very seriously. And that's a lesson for all of us. A big lesson from this, when somebody makes a promise to Allah and they break their promise, the kafara, the compensation for that is to free slaves. Right? So she would free 40 slaves. So a lot of people became free because of this. Another small quick point from here, uh, it mentions that when Ibn Zubair entered, he went beyond the hijab and he hugged them. So this is an interesting point that many people may not realize. The word hijab, what does it actually mean? The word hijab, what it meant throughout Muslim history and what it means to English speaking Muslims today is two completely different things. Today when we hear the word hijab, what do we think of? The scarf. But that in Islam is just called the khimar or covering your own. That's really what it is, covering your own. That was not called hijab. When you hear the word hijab in the Quran or in the Hadith, because the Quran and Hadith say that hijab was for the wives of the Prophet. And that's where people make a mistake. When the Hadith, Quran says that the hijab is for the wives of the Prophet, in Surah al azab it's not talking about the scar. It's talking about a special partner section in the house that no one besides any bathrooms to go beyond. It meant that the wives of Rasulullah were completely cut off from men besides their partners. That there would be a screen between them and other men, even if they go out and they go in a carriage, it would be in a screen carriage. That screen was called the hijab. So we hear the word hijab in the Quran and Hadith, it, it has a completely different meaning of how we use it today. And again, I mention this because some people must understand this. They see the verse saying that this is for the wife of the Prophet and say, oh, we don't have to wear hijab. It's not talking about what you wear. It's talking about the screen between the Prophet's wives and men. That there was a stricter level of barda for the Prophet's wives than for other women. Right? That's what the word hijab means in classical Islamic resources. As for covering of the hair, that is an obligation. That is called covering your aura. That is called wearing a khimar. It's just that in modern linguistics, we started using the word hijab to describe it. And there's nothing wrong with that. Because the meaning of words change over time. The problem is when you take a modern meaning of a word and apply it to a classical text at the end of the day, wrong understanding. Right? So it's important to know this difference. The final lesson I want us to take from this hadith is that, you know, when looking at Ibn Zubair, the extent he goes to to patch things up with his aunt. How many of us have, have really tried going that far to patch it up with family members who, who broke it off with us? You know, for many of us, if a family will break up with us, like, yeah, that's their business, I don't care, right? But look at this, he literally tricks me to let him into the house. Like, they literally hatch a plan and hide him under a cloak and sneak him into the house just because for him, this is such a big thing. To break family ties is such a big thing. To boycott someone for more than three days is such a big thing. That he goes out of his way, not just for him, but out of care for her, out of love for her, and he doesn't want her to be doing anything wrong. Because his whole, uh, Rationale here that he tells his uh, his his uh, uncles here is that she's doing something haram. We need to stop her from doing something haram. Look how this is that that love and care for somebody else's soul. We don't want them to be doing something wrong. So you go out of your way to remind them and to help them. This is a very powerful story from Adab al-Bufrad 
that I feel like we all get better from. I want to end with one last hadith. As the hadith I remind myself of very often and try to live by. And I think all of you will be able to relate to this hadith and it will help you as it helps me. Right? Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu narrates, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Al-Mu'minu al-lazhi yukhalidu al-nas wa yasbiru ala adahu khayru min al-lazhi la yukhalidu al-nas wa la yasbiru ala adahu. The believer who mixes with people and is patient when they harm is better than the one who does not mix with people or bear their harm. This hadith encourages us to be part of a community, to interact with others, to contribute to society. At the same time, it warns us that when you are part of a community, when you are interacting with others, some people are going to get on your nerves. Some people are going to say things that hurt you. Some people might do things that hurt you. Some people are going to really frustrate you. But the believer puts up with all of that. Because the, 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 the benefits of being a part of a community outweigh all of these little harms that come from our daily interactions. So this hadith is both a call on us to be part of a community and it's also a realistic description of what happens when you're part of a community. Because let's see, what's the number one reason why people want to just move to the mountains and disappear from society? They're tired of everybody else, right? They're tired of everybody else's nonsense, they just want to sit alone and worship Allah. Our religion doesn't encourage us to be mocks. It doesn't encourage us to cut ourselves off from people and to just sit in the mountains with and worship Allah all day. No, it encourages us to be people of the community, to be involved, to 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 bear with other people's faults. Because when you are part of the community, you're going to meet people whose personalities clash with you. You're going to meet people who even the, the, the way they talk may irritate you. Right? You're going to meet people who say things that really upset you. Just be patient with that. Because the bonds of community are so important. And so this hadith is a reminder because I myself, I get, I'm a very introverted person. I get very irritated when people, you know, behave inappropriately. And sometimes you think maybe it's better to just go to an island and just sit and worship Allah. And just sit and write your books and just be alone all the time. But then every time that happens, I remind myself of this hadith. That the real reward is to be part of a community, no matter how much the community harms you. I think it was Hassan al Banna of the, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood who mentioned that if we serve the community because of the community, we would have given up years ago. But we serve the community for Allah. And we serve the community for Allah because the community is not going to appreciate what you do all the time. In fact, sometimes the opposite is going to happen. Sometimes you're going to do something for the benefit of the community and they're going to get angry with you. This happens to everyone. Everyone's had a thing point in your life where you did something that you know the community is going to appreciate, they're going to benefit from it, they all will be happy with you, and somehow it becomes a scandal, somehow it becomes a story, somehow people manage to twist it, make it look like a villain. The lesson you take from this hadith is you just keep serving the community. No matter how much they harm you, they are still the Muslim community. So you still be together, you still be there for each other, you still help each other, even though you get on each other's nerves. Sober is used to describe the kind of relationship we should have with other people. That dealing with people requires sober. That is one of the lessons that we take from this hadith, and that is one of the most important parts of our other akhlaq, that every Muslim needs to internalize with that we come to the end of today's presentation. I hope we want all of these are hadith beneficial. Uh, we'll take for five minutes of questions if they are any. Uh, sorry, you mentioned eight doors to Jannah. Can you just listen to me? Which one? The eight doors to Jannah. I can't hear you. Eight doors to Jannah. The eight doors to Jannah. Eight doors to Jannah. I actually can't remember them. Okay. I know one is fasting, one is salam, one is jihad, but the other one I can't remember. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Just go with that way. Let me do that quickly. Okay, there it is. It's right there in Google. Salah, jihad, charity, fasting, hajj, um, 
serving others, faith, etc. Right? So if you just search online, you can see websites that are listed in. Uh, but basically, these are the different types of good deeds that people excel at. Some people excel at Salah by praying on the Hajjun, some at Jihad, all the way to Palestine. So then we have the Salah, those who write for charity, fasting, some people fast almost every day of their life, except in the days when it's prohibited. Hajj and Umrah, uh, those who control them. So that's an interesting one. Those who control their anger and forgive people. That's basically the door of people of Adab or Allah, people who have good character. Sincere faith, that's one of the doors of Jannah. So you have sincere faith. And finally, to uh, people who continuously remember Allah. So basically, if you look carefully at all of those categories, they envelop every possible good deed that you could do. Okay, any other questions? So with that, we'll conclude. Jazakallah khairan. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.